Welcome to another episode of Conduct Detrimental. Dan Lust joined this episode by Emily Costanzo and Mr. 301 Conlon Farrell. Conlon, what do you have to say for yourself? I mean, listen, I don't have to say much because the people, they say enough to me. Just thanking, kissing the ring when it's simply this day and time, inflation, what it is, the economy. I try to put money in people's pockets. So I, I don't know what you're talking about. You lost last week. So um, I pushed. Listen, so a push is a it. loss. Save it. Shouldn't save have it. to There's educate two- you on gambling, but I guess. Listen, listen, save it. Too many words here. You you were still Mr. Undefeated. I'll give it to you with 3 and one Emily, more importantly here, let's let's give Emily the shine. You have a very big announcement. Emily, you ready for it? I'm always ready, Dan. Did you Tell get the me. bar results back? Did you get the bar results back? I did get those bar results back, Dan. As everyone knows, a list of this podcast we're sponsored by Themis Bar Review. Emily, who'd you use for the uh, for the bar? Themis, of course. Themis Bar Review. Uh, there was no better way to promote the podcast by signing up for Themis and telling them that we sent you. Use our promo code con detrimental. Themis Bar con detrimental. Okay, uh, on to the fun stuff. You ready for this, guys? We have a loaded episode. We can talk about. Some, you know, by the end of the podcast, some very serious stories, but give you a little bit of a roadmap to, and then we'll get into some, you know, some stuff off the bat. But we're going to talk Devante Adams, the misdemeanor assault charge is now out. Draymond Green, his, uh, we'll say an assault incident, not resulting in assault charge, resulting in uh, some NBA discipline, maybe, maybe uh, less than some expected. We're going to talk a little bit, the follow up to the concussion protocol story. And then Emily, I brought you here in particular is. As our OG listeners know, you are a former Division One soccer player, and I have been following this NWSL story very closely. Yeah, I think you're the perfect person to talk about it. We were going to have you on last week, and then there kept being more and more developments, so we waited for a little bit more to come out. And for those that are not following, ESPN Daily covered it. I'm, I'm seeing it really everywhere. It's a bizarre, troubling, concerning, whatever you want to call it, unprecedented story of allegations of abuse, sexual assault between coaches and players and commissioners allegedly slash maybe not even allegedly covering things up. We always want to bring you all the stories of, of sports and law. So loaded, loaded episode. Um, before we do that, Colin, Emily, you guys going to ask me how my weekend was at Disney? How your weekend was? Yeah. That was I weekend. can guess that you started off Friday with your uh, Nebraska Cornhuskers beating my Rutgers Scarlet Knights in the, one of the worst games I've seen played in that stadium. And that says a lot because that team has been bad for numerous years now. So I'll say like, that's how it started. I don't know how it rest of the one. I saw Disney pictures though, right? Yeah. No, um, you nailed it. My Friday night started off wonderfully. Nebraska got a okay. win top of the big 10 West, which nobody expected. Um, and uh, yeah, spent the weekend at Disney with a three-year-old and a one-year-old Disney princesses. We just found out Emily, I see you smiling. Okay. We, we came from Mickey and Minnie and my daughter, my three-year-old fell in love with a Disney character that I have never heard of called Vampirina. Okay. She's a vampire. She goes to elementary school. She's in a rock band. She's like all American girl, except she's not all American. She's from Transylvania. She's great. That's- Guys, do anything fun this weekend that I was not aware of? Emily, I think you're still in bar recovery mode. Colin, you're licking your wounds from your betting picks with uh, Emily. <laughs> anything, anything fun we missed? I mean, I was at the Yankee game last night. Here we go. So, and they were losing until I got there and everything turned around. So I'm not going to say I'm going to take credit for the win, but. Colin, I know you were spamming our sports law group chat, which uh, if any of our listeners want to get a part of it, you are certainly welcome to just reach out to us. But, you know, I think it was meant for like sports law conversations. Colin's like, anybody selling tickets? Anybody selling tickets? <laughs> of course, the lawyers gang up on the one kid that's a non-lawyer. I saw that coming. However, Miss Costanzo failed to say that the only reason she was inside the stadium was because somebody, a gracious soul, you know what I mean, that's not in all these jury dealings in court, right, just decided he wanted to help some people out. So let's do this. Let's start in the world of the NFL. I think uh, unless you're living under a rock, that was the biggest story today. Devontae Adams on Monday night, really kind of a hard fought loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. I got off the plane on Monday night uh, and the Raiders were up big at halftime. And I go, oh, interesting. I guess the Raiders are going to win, turn around their season. That is not what happened. A very frustrating loss for Devontae Adams. I have seen all angles of this in the last, I don't know, 48, 72 hours. It looks like a, a videographer runs across the path of Devontae Adams as he's leaving the tunnel after the game. There's some debate in the video world whether this videographer actually struck Devontae Adams with the with the camera. But either way, what is very clear on video is Devontae Adams, star wide receiver for the Las Vegas Raiders, his first year there, 
throws this guy over, and then just kind of like does the um, Allen Iverson Ty Lue like step over. There's no remorse. There's nothing like that. He just walks off. He doesn't look back to see if the guy's okay. There's nothing like that. Comes across our ticker today. A police report is filed, and he has been charged under Kansas City Municipal Code section. I believe it's 50-169 is for normal, simple, misdemeanor assault, intentionally inflicting bodily harm upon another person. So, yeah, I certainly have some thoughts in it. But, Emily Conlon, I will turn it over to you. Uh, Overall thoughts on what happens to be the biggest story, at least as of today in the NFL world maybe not the going to be the most popular. I so don't think this deserves the attention it's getting. You're not supposed to hit people. You should not hit people. You should not shove people. That's, that's definitely, you know, I, I get that, but there's, there's a, I was watching um, ESPN and they were saying, you know, the, the tunnel should be clear. It's after the game, the guy, presumably the guy knows that. And it's after, I mean, emotions are running high after the game. The guy gets in his way. He shoves him. Now, again, probably should help him up. Probably shouldn't have shoved him. Could have walked around. But the fact that this is getting as much attention as it is, is insane to me. I feel the exact same way. I mean, it's, it's an absolute joke that this has even gotten to the point of there's a court date because Devontae Adams at 6'4 and 250 pounds ran into someone who is not an NFL player and he sell, fell over like basically one of the three little pigs house. And you know what I mean? And now Devonte Adams is the person that's going to be charged with misdemeanor assault. How is that? That's not assault. Dan Loss, you're famous for the Twitter breakdown of assault. You okay. tell me. Okay. Okay. Listen, listen, Emily, soon to be lawyer, Conlon, maybe at some point you're going to be a lawyer. For the time being, uh, you're the you're the holder of the only mullet on this podcast, so <laughs> hold that title for now. But listen, I gotta gotta lay you guys some something straight here. This is assault. This is textbook assault. I mean, it's an intentional act, and it caused bodily harm on another person. So Emily, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to you for some property stuff in a minute. But you know, it's been a while since I was in law school. But listen, what what I do remember, right? That if you're a trespasser on someone else's property, you certainly have less rights than someone who's invited on someone's property or even a public place. So what happened here, right? This was not an incident of a trespasser, right? Where we'll talk a little bit about the the fan at the Rams game from a, from a week or so ago, but this was a guy and and you guys know, I worked in the, I worked for the giants way back when I did, I was on the game day staff. One of my really fancy slash really nerdy jobs. I would run the credential machine. I would hand out vests to different people, different color vests for photographers, videographers, so I, I know this world, right? There's the same people you see at the game every day. What you guys failed to take into account here is this guy, right? He didn't have to file a police report, right? So that's your point. You said this wasn't a big deal, blah, blah. He doesn't have to. But right now, this guy filing a police report, he, you know, I'm not sure, I wouldn't be so sure if I were him if he's going to get back in the field in the NFL game again. This guy felt it was important enough to file a police report against not just any football player, Devontae Adams, who was the biggest, you know, free agent signing for the maybe the Las Vegas Raiders ever you know, last couple of years of the Raiders organization. But at the end of the day, right, guys, like if you push someone and he's not a trespasser and he's not like a fan who's running on the field, it's a guy who's just doing his job. I don't know, maybe he shouldn't have been in the tunnel. You can't throw, you know, someone that's in NFL circles like that. So my my thoughts, right. Obviously, I should this be a misdemeanor assault charge? I don't really think so. But then again, it's the letter of the law. It was an intentional assault on another person. And right, it's not like an unruly fan that got to the field that's going to be causing harm. It's like some, you know, random videographer. You can't be throwing people like that. So I think the bigger concern, and Emily and, and Conlon, I mean, like, do you guys care that they put Devontae Adams' like address out on blast for the whole world to see? I, I kind of find that to be a little uh, shot in front, right? Is that is that a different expression? I mean, the entire thing in general is, again, blown entirely out of proportion. Let's just bring it back to a couple of years back, Miles Garrett and Mason Rudolph getting into the scuffle that involved Miles Garrett using his helmet to bash Mason Rudolph's skull, and there was no police report filed. That to me, how is that not? Is that not more than misdemeanor assault? If you did that to someone on the street, it's probably the same yeah, thing. But, but- see, I don't. So, Kamala, this is where I disagree with you. Just because that that happened and the there wasn't it didn't escalate to the level that this is escalating to doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. They, that could have easily escalated to a miss a charge as well. And Dan, I agree with you that yes, letter of law. Okay. It is an assault. You cannot do this. I know this from my bar studying. I think honestly though, too, I think I, it, 
the whole situation puts a bad taste in my mouth, the coverage of it, because this is getting so much attention so quickly. And it's like you said, Dan, it's everywhere. And I know we'll, t- we'll obviously get to this later, but you've got female athletes with way, 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 way more serious allegations. And this isn't covered for years, but then one football player shoves over a little videographer and it's all anyone can talk about. So I think that's also why I'm taking the stance I am. If there's no police report filed by the photographer, is this story a big deal? Devonte Adams warned a suspension if there's nothing that's put in ink in Kansas City. Okay, let's let's flip it a little bit. Ready for this? And I have the answer to that question. Let's say the push occurred on a, on a ref. Is there a suspension coming then? Yeah, probably. What's the difference, right? If you're pushing someone who's allowed to be in that particular position Mm -hmm. and you're kind of admitting to, I I read Devontae Adams' apology, which I wasn't thrilled with. He said he was frustrated in the moment and you push somebody. He's admitting to do it intentionally. So if you, you know, I I remember um, there's different incidents in NFL and and NBA when someone, you know, just careless knocks someone over or like Mm -hmm. you're in the middle of a play and a wide receiver is running around, they run into the ref, like, okay, it happens, right? But yeah. he, he essentially admits doing it on purpose. So here's, here's the thing, right? Uh, and I guess we'll take one step back. The filing of a police report, you know, you brought up, Colin, it was a, it was a good point about Mason Rudolph and, and Miles Garrett, but like the, the police report being filed is solely within the control of those two parties. So mm-hmm. I don't know, they kept it within the, within the shield, within the fraternity. They didn't want to file a police report. Rudolph didn't want to do it, so be it. This mm-hmm. videographer is kind of on the periphery. He's not quite a ref. He's not a player. He's not a coach, but... He's in the circles. He's in the tunnel. Like I've, I've seen it. I've handed out those vests. He's on the field. I'm sure, you know, many games. And what did he do? He decided that it was worth worthy enough to, to file this. So do I think he's going to get suspended? I think the, the chance of him getting suspended are higher today than they were, you know, uh, 24, 48 hours ago. I don't necessarily think it's going to happen still. I'll do you one guys. Listen, you guys know I'm a sports law story and I follow all this. Alvin Kamara running back for the, the saints was caught on video seemingly right assault battery whatever whatever your jurisdiction is hitting someone on video and it wasn't prompted by self-defense or anything like that you know maybe his attorney will argue that but it was something that was caught on video Alvin Kamara has missed a game this year because they're my fantasy team so I do know that but he hasn't missed a game for suspension purposes so if Alvin Kamara if they set the standard in the NFL can just play out for assaulting someone not even having anything to do with the game versus, you know, a game, you know, I, I think we can all understand. Devontae Adams is feeling a little bit upset by the game. There were videographers in his face. Like, I think it's kind of understandable. But if Kamara's not going to get suspended at all, it's not going to shock me if Adams isn't. But certainly I think we're approaching, we'll see what the weekend bears out, but we're approaching a 50-50 scenario. And I think the Raiders are on by this week, so maybe maybe it'll blow yeah. over a little bit. Guys, anything further on this particular topic before we move on? Um, I just think the entire thing, we'd like to talk a lot about optics in the NFL in regards to the Deshaun Watson case was a big deal because of the alleged, I mean, not alleged, the things he did were heinous, but he is serving a far less suspension than Calvin Ridley is. And Dan Lush, you pointed out to me when we brought that up back in the summer that it was because there was no precedent. So what is the precedent for the Devontae Adams situation right now? I mean, what's it going to say? I mean, we got to see what the punishment is to figure out what the precedent is. I mean, that's 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 the truth here. So there's been assault cases before in the NFL, and guys have been suspended. Yeah, but this is this is that weird line of like, like okay, let's let's go through some sports law history here. And we didn't we didn't practice, you know, we didn't talk about this, but the Charles Spiro choked his coach once upon a time, suspended, shipped out of town to the Knicks, right? Once upon a time, if you bump a ref, you throw a ref. Usually, you get a technical or a coach will get thrown out for the next game. This is where I think there's something interesting, and and this is probably where we should talk about it. The other angle of this, right? The Bobby Wagner is a you know defensive player over on the Rams. Fan runs on the field. He decks the fan. The fan is claiming I think a concussion and maybe some rib injuries or some sort. Also filed a police report. There is no sniffs, no inkling that Bobby Wagner is going to be suspended by the NFL or the Rams or anything like that. So what's the difference? Two people were injured, right? Allegedly filing two two police reports. One, there's a conversation like we're having right now about getting a suspension. In Bobby Wagner's case, no one, everyone's like, yeah, assumption of the risk, right? And it's true. If a fan runs on the field, they know exactly, you know, I have a good idea of what's going to happen. They're going to get tackled by the security guard or a player. They're still going to get injured. But a videographer, by putting on one of those vests and running around with the scrums at the end of the game, certainly they don't consent to the same level of getting thrown around like a player might or a coach or a fan. So that's, you know, Conlon, you ask if there's precedent. The only one I could think of is Dennis Rodman kicking that that uh, videographer, you know, below the waist a couple of years ago. 
during the Bulls, you know, the Jordan run. I think he got suspended for that, if memory serves. And I, I, we'll see. We'll see. But it's troubling history, which we talked about it tons of times on this podcast. If Alvin, Alvin Kamara doesn't get suspended for a version of assault, he has his own charges. I think there was even talk potentially of felony charges in that particular case sticking. Misdemeanor charge is not a violation. It's not like disorderly conduct. It is a misdemeanor assault charge. So whether it's under, you know, state law or, you know, the municipal code, it still comes with potential imprisonment. It's, it's not going to, it's going to get pled down. You know, I, I, maybe even the charge doesn't stick at all, but the charge is legitimate. It was an intentional harm on someone else. It as, it was assault by definition. So that's the case. And we'll see what the, the precedent falls. Let's stick with another incident of, uh, we'll say, alleged assault, seemingly assault caught on video. That is what happened with Draymond Green and the Golden State Warriors. Another, another if you're living under a rock, somehow you, you missed it. But story between a Michigan State alum, Draymond Green, and Michigan University alum, Jordan Poole. So there's a couple of legal angles I think we could take this. But the obvious one, right, is Draymond Green winding up and knocking Jordan Poole out. That seems to be pretty simple assault. You know, uh, there's been a fine that's result, no suspensions. We can get into that a little bit. Where I want to take our conversation initially is how that video got out. There's been reports. I've seen numbers as high as a million. I've seen 100,000. And I've also seen a number reported by a friend of the show and, and multiple time guest of the show, AJ Perez of Front Office Sports, who says that number was less than 10,000. So what, what is that number I'm talking about? The amount of money that was paid by TMZ Sports to somebody around the Golden State Warriors organization. I've seen a lot of people shaming the video department. My understanding in talking to people around NBA spaces and agents, that video was in the possession of multiple people. So uh, there's been stories told in recent days that owners sometimes have a live feed of practice going directly to them, right? Sometimes there's a feed in the, you know, the press box or the front office. And sometimes someone might have a video camera out just recording the simulcast or contemporaneous feed. All I know is that, my, again, my understanding from people that would be in the know, the video was in the hands of a lot of different people. We don't know exactly who leaked the video, but, right, we do know the video was leaked because in the immediate aftermath, there was stories written in print about, you know, there was an altercation of practice, Draymond Green to apologize, not that big of a deal. It was a kind of some, like, preemptive damage control done. And then, wait, tick, 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 then the video comes out. So... Could there be, Emily and, and Conlon, my, my future lawyers, emphasis on future lawyers, right? Neither of you are lawyers at this point in time. Could there be a cause of action for the leaking of that video to TMZ Sports? First of all, I am a lawyer. We've been over this. I am not yet an attorney. Thank you, Dan. Explain this. Explain this. I'd love to, I'd love to hear have the audience perspective on this because I did not in, know. In Connecticut. You are a lawyer once you get your JD, which I have and Conlon does not. And then you are an attorney once you pass the bar and are sworn in. I have not been sworn in. Therefore, I am not an attorney, but I am a lawyer. We've covered this a bunch on the podcast. We covered the John Gruden case a lot. We're probably waiting for an update. John Gruden, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the Las Vegas litigation waters between Alvin Kamara, whose incident occurred in Vegas, Gruden, and now Devontae Adams. But story for another day. John Gruden is currently suing the NFL relating to the leak of his emails to the media. So he was saying it's essentially a claim of tortious interference with his contract that the NFL leaked those emails that essentially cost him his job. So we're going to see what happens with Draymond Green. There's an interesting subplot in here that like Draymond was fined, not suspended by the Warriors. That fine money didn't go into Jordan Poole's pocket to pay for his Maybe medical expense. I don't know what happened to him. Yeah. Went to the Warriors pocket. So it's kind of an interesting oddity. But listen, we'll, we'll see what comes of it. We'll see if there's potentially uh, some marketing deals that are lost. If, for example, the Warriors cut Draymond Green, which they're not going to do, if they did that, certainly tortious interference with business expectations, tortious interference with the contract, you'd have to have some inkling that someone high enough in the Golden State franchise organization leaked it. If it's an intern and he just was a rogue actor, yeah, you're going to have a hard time showing that it was, you know, an action that was controlled by the organization. But if that was leaked by ownership, which was the narrative that was kind of playing out uh, in the immediate aftermath, the question is, right, like, Draymond Green earns a ton, a ton of money, and maybe that's a contract they'd want to get off of. I mean, it's certainly plausible. He's in an opt-out year after this year. He's had his plenty of his fair share of run-ins with just his attitude in general. Obviously, again, he's a large personality to manage in that locker room. Again, I think he's played his best years are behind him. 
And Jordan Poole could be the new face of the Warriors for the next decade. So who should you keep happy? Should you keep Draymond Green, again, who's won multiple titles with you, or the next face of your franchise? So Jordan Poole, again, and that punch was ridiculous. That's like, we're talking about Devontae Adams' misdemeanor assault. That, to me, is a salt with a capital A and a capital T at the end. That is ridiculous. To punch a teammate like that is somebody that's a leader in that locker room. Again, I've, I've never had much respect for Draymond Green. I think he's good at what he does. But that, to me, is just something that nobody will ever let him live down. And people that are letting him say that he's going through stuff, that's pathetic. People don't act like that. You don't do that to a teammate. Is anything happening in Jordan Poole? Because Jordan Poole pushed him first, right? I believe. Oh. I mean, listen, it's not, it's, not, it's not evenly matched. I mean, Draymond Green approached Jordan Poole in a confrontational manner to begin with. Okay, but he approached him. He didn't touch him. And Jordan Poole shoved him. And he was face to face. Him. When somebody is that level of in your face, right? And like, again, Draymond Green's clearly the one that initiated the entire thing. You can see Jordan Poole literally ignoring him to the point to where he's now face to face and has to act in self-defense. That's what it was. This is a very important point. If you watch this video, and I've watched it plenty, plenty of times at this point, Jordan Poole must have said something. It's clear he's, he's said, it looks like he said something, and there's mm. different rumblings that he said something in the days prior and something leading up. But in any event, Draymond gets in his face, okay? At that point where Draymond's in his face, there are no Warriors teammates that are even reacting. They're, like, indifferent to what's going on. So I, you, you would think, right, if Jordan Poole said something that was really that terrible, right, where, where there was no sound on the video that's been released, you know, that maybe the players would expect that something would happen. But mm. very quickly, right? It goes from a push. And again, no players react to really the, the push or the interface. And then all of a sudden, Draymond very quickly winds up. And Draymond's a much, you know, he's a much bigger guy, right? He's playing the four, playing the five. Poole is a, you know, point guard is a shooting guard. But yeah, I, I don't think anybody expected it. So the question that we're kind of raising is like, you know, was, was a, there are certain contexts in the law where some, not a lot, but that some words can rise to level where it can equate to some type of physical action back. I mean, listen, we're just, we're trying to view this Zapruder film and trying to figure out exactly what happened here, but it doesn't look like Draymond can claim any form of real self-defense because the push was much less force than a punch to the jaw from close range. I mean, it, it's not, they're not really equatable. No, it's not even close. Again, like I said, it's somebody's in your face and the fact that Jordan Poole didn't shove him to where the point Draymond Green was knocked back. It was basically get out of my face. And that, happens in NBA practices all the time. That's a regular occurrence. Guys competing one another. That's something you expect and is not a headline. Right, Drawing somebody in the that. mouth like it's a UFC main card, that's an issue. And when it's leaked by people that, again, I think Golden State wants Draymond out. And I think it was leaked by ownership. I don't think it was an intern. I think this was a planned thing that once the opportunity presented itself, they took it like that. You just said that there, so guys are always in each other's faces. That's not a big deal, but you were just saying that Draymond being in Jordan's face, you were just saying it was reasonable for him to be back to respond with a shove. So I don't, yeah, because a shove to the chest, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. You were just saying that it, the guys are in each other's faces all the time. That's not, not a big deal. So technically, right. you're saying that the first big deal is the shove, or you just don't think the shove no, the deal. first big deal is the punch to the jaw that knocks Jordan Poole on his ground like he's, you know, I mean, Khabib knocking out Conor McGregor. That, to me, is the level of escalation where, wow, this is an issue. Like Dan just said, nobody really reacted when Draymond and them just kind of, you know, I mean, we're talking. People are like, holy, what just happened after Draymond landed the punch? And you can tell Jordan Poole wasn't, he had no expectation that was going to go there. Right. This is, again, we're trying to find, Conlon, you raised this good point about precedent. I'm happy to bring in a precedent. We, we've taught you well, right? Lawyers, we don't, what do we do? We just look at similar cases in other contexts and we use those past cases to predict future outcomes. Secret. I mean, for any of our, uh, you know, uh, undergrads listening to this, I mean, that's the secret of being a lawyer, just understanding similar cases in that particular arena and finding comparable cases. That's, that's the, the easiest way to describe what being a lawyer is and getting templates and, you know, and massaging the templates and fun stuff like that. Um, but, but here's the thing, right? We're talking about players getting suspended, right? Malice at the palace, right? Was an incident of assault between players and fans. Okay, we can say that's an easy suspension. We just talked about a hypothetical where a player might punch a ref, easy suspension. Now we're getting in the gray area. If you, if you push a videographer, should you get suspended? 
Now, of all of those acts, right? Like if we're trying to figure out where this is on the spectrum, punching your own teammate is pretty bad. I mean, it's it knocking your own teammate out cold. That's that's levels of like Rudy Tomjanovich back in the day is you know an old case about a basketball player punching an opposing player, right? Miles Garrett, Mason Rudolph. If it's in the vicinity of things that just shouldn't happen, especially Draymond Green, who's you know a Golden State Warriors life or multiple time NBA champion, a leader in the locker room, can't be doing that. So personally, this is this is my personal take on this, right? You know, obviously no police report filed. Jordan Poole, same situation with Miles Gatton and Mason Rudolph. Players don't seem to file police reports against one another. It wasn't going to happen. But I think the only reason that, uh, honestly, that he was not suspended here is because the Warriors team, right, Steph and Clay, Jordan Poole, they didn't want him to get suspended. I think if Jordan Poole had asked to get him suspended or if Poole was legitimately very hurt, I don't, I don't think there's any f- flexibility here, but Draymond's role within the team, you can't cut the guy. He's paid, you know, paid too much money to the terrible optics. You guys just won the title. I think this had to be a directive from somewhere talking it over between Clay, everybody on staff, and just saying, you know what, Steve Kerr, let's not suspend him. I think it's a Caesar we pay a fine, but I don't, I'm not sure that sends the right message. It's a, that's a joke. I mean, if that's where the Warriors of Steph Clay – um, and Steve Kerr meeting up in Steve Kerr's treehouse to decide, oh, how should we punish Draymond? And all of a sudden, you know, he really didn't hit on that hard. If we just say they came to blows, you know, I mean, maybe it'll all blow over. Blatant lie. That comes out the next day. That's not coming to blows. That is a assault and battery, two legal terms, correct? That's, isn't it, what that, what is it? What, if you do that to a stranger on the street, what happens next? Oh, they, basically they get fined. And again, you just said, it doesn't go to Jordan Poole's jaw. Or right. dentist. So not to, to get into a, a harsher tones though, but like I'm seeing some people online saying, well, it's his own team. It's different than a ref. Some it's should be kept in-house. And then you have to ask the question, right? Again, legal podcast, we got to talk about stuff like this. If it was an assault that occurred within someone's family, right? That doesn't mean it's okay, right? There's some scenarios where that could be worse, right? That 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 shouldn't why 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 is an assault that occurs within in-house, right? In the in someone's own property, within with between siblings, between husband and wife, anything like that, that doesn't make it Better or worse, they're just different. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you, Conlon. I don't necessarily think this should have been something that's policed in house. I have no problem with the NBA if they wanted to to issue a suspension to Draymond. I just I think it's a really bad message to send. And and on top of it, right, guys, whether you realize it or not, you guys are both part of the conduct detrimental family. We're members of the media here. We have enough enough downloads, enough friends in the media space. I think we could say we're we're media members now. Draymond's a member of the media. He's his own podcast, right? Like. It was a joke. I was listening to Pat Bev's new podcast on Barstool and mm-hmm. they were making a joke like, like Pat Bev, you remember the new media? And he's like, well, I'm not out of here punching people yet. So I guess I'm not. It's like, it's, it's not a good look from a number of levels. And we're talking about sports business, sports law. Dream on green, I think was very well positioned to be in that Barkley role, to be yeah. the most outspoken guy on any broadcast has a job for the next 20, 30 years, however long you wanted to, but can't go around punching people, right? Just ask Ron Artest, ask Dennis Rodman, like, they're not really in that media, you know, that, that world. So I yeah, know what it means, but uh, I think it, I think it will have an impact. You can't, you can't do that. Necessarily with the whole Ron Artest and Draymond comparison, Ron Artest did not have any personality for TV after hanging it up. I don't think Ron Artest really knew what channel TNT was on. So Draymond at least has the ability to have enough viewership and attention in his podcast. Again, I despise him as a person and think he's is what he is. But he does have people that follow him consistently all the time. So he's a personality. And this, again, better or worse, it's going to get garner attention. And he's the most talked about player in the NBA right now. And he's probably the 60th best, maybe. I subscribe to the Draymond Green podcast. But now that I'm listening, right, I'm thinking like he, he had done that day. I think the when the incident occurred, he had done a podcast with Pat Bev. And, you know, you just you can't. They kind of like swept it on the rug, correct? Yeah, but you you just I think it, I think it actually happened after they finished recording. But you know it is it is what it is. It's a separate story. But I don't know. I'm just again. People ask me how does this make sense? How does this align with this? And I'm like, mm. sometimes they don't align. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But right at the end of the day, we all have to remember as sports fans, as lawyers, these sports leagues are private associations, private rules. They can really do whatever they want, and it doesn't have to make sense. It's just it's kind of the owner's world and. Uh, we, try to, we just kind of live in it. But let's hit this one quick, moving on to our third topic. So we spent a lot of time in, in our last long episode with Dan Wallach and myself. The feedback is in. It was very well received. We had Jim Quinn to talk about kind of um, NFL uh, issues and player advocacy, the history of player advocacy, 
And that was coupled with Rich Ornberger, former offensive lineman for Tom Brady's Patriots, suffered a concussion back in the day. So what we explained, and you know, for those that, that didn't listen to it, I certainly implore you to go back into it. But at least with um, Rich Ornberger, we were talking about like how how are the UFC and boxing a safer sport than football? At the end of the day, like if you can't stand up for 10 seconds in boxing, it's over. You don't get half time to recover. It's over. Your day is over. You're going to take weeks. And sometimes boxers take months, sometimes years before they box again. And the UFC, if you have one moment where your eyes roll to the back of your head, it's over. You don't get a 20 minute recovery period. So when it came to the NFL, at least under their prior protocol, if you want to believe the NFL, we do have some updates on this front. The NFL says that they did everything right. That the Dolphins team doctor did everything right. And the independent neurotrauma expert, this is a new development. They did a full investigation and the NFL found that nobody did anything wrong. So that's interesting because the NFL PA fired the neuro, neurotrauma expert. Uh, I guess they had sole discretion to do that under the CBA that the if one side wanted to fire the independent, they could. So the NFL is out here saying that the independent doctor did nothing wrong and the Dolphins did nothing wrong. Protocol was followed. Um, and the NFL PA is saying that protocol wasn't followed because we just fired the doctor. Clearly, right? It's a matter of who's not telling the truth here. You're trying to read between the lines, right? The NFL is saying everything was done right. The NFL PA is firing somebody. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the NFL PA steps are going to certainly paint the NFL in a, in a poor light if it does come to litigation. Certain questions are going to be asked. Now, and I'll, I'll turn this over to you as our former athlete here. Have you ever suffered or maybe the symptoms of a concussion, anything like that? When I was in college, I was one concussion away from being declared medically ineligible. Oh, um, I know this. Yes. So, uh, so I was, and we, you know, I was lucky at when I, at UConn, we had very strict concussion protocol. We went, uh, you know, our athletic trainers were really serious about it, obviously, as they should. To be honest, I was shocked that, so ataxia, I don't know, however we pronounce that, the, the NFL added to the no-go symptoms list. I think this is bottom of the barrel that it was not included before. I think it's a low bar to set because I don't know anything about medicine. My twin covers that realm, um, but it's abnormal balance, right? That's like, that's a low, low bar that we're saying that that's, we're just adding that to the no-go list. Here's where, and I have not talked about this in any shows. I'm um, just, you know, I've saved it for our own show. It's been about a week and I've been saving this in the tank. I went to Disney. I was thinking about this exact take. Let's see how many industry people pick up on this. And we'll see. I'll just leave it here. I'm not going to tweet it. See if anybody wants to pick up on this. So the NFL's concussion protocol up until whenever they changed it this past weekend had in their list observation of gait. Observation of gait, uh, and I have some personal injury background. I, you know, when you're a personal injury lawyer, you have to understand body. I did, I did defense work. I haven't done, maybe I've done a handful of plaintiff's personal injury cases, but you have to understand, you know, certain medical terms. You're reading a lot of medical records. Observation of gait, that is a code, at least, at least my vantage point for, right? The observation of someone's stability, right? If someone's not walking properly, I would think that's a synonym for someone's balance or stability. Observation of gait, same thing. So, I read that as being in the policy well before the two incident. So the NFL is like, you know, I'm reading Chris Mortensen had a tweet. Both uh, NFL and NFL PA have reached an agreement on amended concussion protocol. Both sides focused on medical condition known as ataxia, an abnormality of balance and stability, blah, blah, blah. So the, the phrasing of that tweet and a lot of the reports I saw is that they're adding that. Emily, that's, and that's how you read it too. And I think that's the way to read it. But I'm like, I think it was already in the protocol. I just think it wasn't followed because if you watch Tua, the man could not stand up. So going back to the UFC and the boxing point. So he couldn't stand up in the second quarter. Okay. Tua was back on the field in the third quarter. You were not supposed to get a 10 minute grace period after you suffer concussion, after your eyes roll to the back of your head, like they do in UFC, you're out, your night's over for weeks and months. So a little bit of damage control, a little bit of window dressing here. I think this was always in the protocol. And just me, my vantage point, I wasn't in the room, but I don't think it was followed. And I think that's their way of saying, you know what? The protocol was wrong. The doctors didn't do anything wrong. The neuro didn't do anything wrong. You know, it was wrong, the protocol. But at least from my vantage point, I think the protocol was just fine. I just think it wasn't followed. Right. And I think oh, that what? adding this in is a really creative way to say, hey, by the way, we didn't, you know, just what you said, Dan, hey, not our fault, not, you know, not the doctors, whatever, whatever. But it's it's almost more disappointing now, because then if you, again, read, read between the lines, they're not protecting their players and they're saying, oh, we can fall back on this. We can add some protocol. The, the bottom line is that was an awful hit. It was an awful reaction. And clearly he had a very serious head injury. And we're just not. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. Not, not our fault. Not our problem. 
You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna add this, and this is another comment from Dr. Alan Sills, who we mentioned a lot on, on the podcast. He's the NFL's chief medical officer, but during the COVID, you know, back and forth, we, we referenced Dr. Alan Sills a lot. So I, I knew the name. So I mean, this uh, rap report had a tweet. This is an interesting one. And Emily, again, is our former athlete. I loved your I don't necessarily agree with Dr. Sills here, but he writes, quote By the way, Dan, I did play baseball in college. So did you play baseball in college? Well, you were the heads up. Tell me this. <laughs> where'd, you play, where'd you play baseball I did. Hum, hum, humble brag humble brag where'd you play baseball at stockton stockton university gallon new jersey go sprays listen with all due respect to you and i didn't play at, a, at a, i couldn't make the d3 soccer team you guys are both better athletes than i am but i think emily is the division one soccer player at uconn i think we got to give her the benefit of the doubt here and colin can we agree that emily was the highest level player between all three of us yeah whatever you say lost but let me just jump in here at the time the two incident happened against buffalo the current protocol for concussions read as such. A player who demonstrates gross motor instability must be evaluated for concussion. He can, however, return to play if the team position and the UNC conclude that gross motor instability did not have a neurological cause. Right. right? So gross motor instability sounds like if you don't have control of your motor skills, that's not coming from a pulled hamstring. That is a ridiculous loophole that the NFL had snuck in there and is now being exposed for it. They fired the UNC, but at the end of the day, the NFL was to blame for putting that, again, in their bylaws and really throwing it under the rug until they got caught. And now they've been caught, and now it's a big story. So this is this is the quote. And to that point, Colin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're, you're 100% right. Dr. Sills writes, this is a quote from, uh, from Ian Rappaport, everyone involved sees a patient and not a player. No one involved cares about the position of a player or the score of a game. Hard stop. The concussion protocol is not broken, can always improve. That's the nature of medicine. Okay, here's the thing, right? I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I think that Tua came back into that game because it was the Buffalo Bills and it was a tight game. That's why I think he was in the game. And I think Tua wanted to play. And I think that all played a role. So uh, listen, if someone wants to pull the tapes and they can conduct depositions and real tried and true interviews of everyone involved and, and release those reports to the public and we can look at it, I'm not buying it. It's just too coincidental that a guy suffers a really big concussion and then he turns around and he plays on Thursday night against, you know, another big game, right? If he had suffered a tried and true concussion on Sunday night, he would not be eligible for Thursday. So mm-hmm. in theory, they would have missed the Bills game, uh, the rest of the Bills game and the Bengals game. But what they, bang, you know, what the Dolphins – seemingly did i'll say allegedly whatever until we until we need to but they kind of and this is this is my vantage point again i don't have sourcing on this but it seems like they doubled down they said oh two wouldn't suffer a concussion that's why he could play the end absolutely of the game and then they had him play the Bengals game as almost like hey, look he's fine he's back out so i i think it was a disgusting a disgusting act and uh you know karma karma is what it is this past week we're talking about how new protocols come into effect teddy bridgewater gets kicked out of the game before he throws a pass and, you know, the Dolphins had to play with a third string quarterback, which, you know, uh, I follow this stuff very closely. The Denver Broncos were accused of committing all these different COVID protocol violations. And wouldn't you know, Conlon, they played with a wide receiver at quarterback during uh, the, the COVID era. So I, I, am, I don't think these are coincidences. I think Teddy Bridgewater was the first uh, quarterback to be kicked out because of the protocol. And he happened to be on the Dolphins. Do I think that's a coincidence? Not really. Not really. No. At all. Again, and – they said Teddy Bridgewater actually passed what was the week prior's protocol of concussion baseline, whatever they evaluated him for. But there's no way in hell Teddy Bridgewater is going to be allowed to go back in that game. However, I will just say this. Good for Mike McDaniel. Putting on McGruber on the plane ride home is known to alleviate concussion symptoms of almost all your uh, prized quarterbacks. So him and Tua watch McGruber on the way back. And you know what? I think everything – from then on, should be okay. I mean, an absolute joke and downplaying the severity of something that's really, really bad. Let's close on this. There's a, a trial that's taking place this week involving another concussion lawsuit, uh, this time in the NCAA, a former USC linebacker named Matthew Gee passed away in 2018. You know, the, the doctors ruled that it was, was a result, at least in part, that he suffered from um, CTE. I'm not exactly sure we can pin the cause of death on at this point, but it's a negligence case, and the the allegation from Matthew G and his family is that years of concussions at the a collegiate level caused ultimately caused his death. Now, I gave a comment to front office sports. 
I certainly think, you know, the NFL and the NCAA to certain points have been negligent. Are you going to really be able to show that concussions maybe in the, you know, the eighties and the nineties was the true cause of death of someone that died in 2018. I think you're going to have a really tough time showing causation, but I, you know, I got some, some pushback from those comments, but I, I, I just mean to say that there are, there's more that the NFL and the NCAA could be doing. I don't know if maybe this, maybe this case, this lawsuit's going to be the one that opens up the, the floodgates in the collegiate ranks, but I will give Dr. Allen Sills and the NFL a little bit of credit. They kicked it into gear, right? I'm a, you know, I've been fantasy sports commissioner in a number of leagues. No one makes rule changes mid-year. I think the NFL and the NFLPA got it right. They changed the rules on the fly immediately, and they made it a point this past weekend to kick guys out of the game left and right for acts that normally wouldn't be, you know, uh, people wouldn't be ruled out for that. So uh, we don't really give the NFL many wins on this podcast, but I think they're moving in the right direction. But there's still work to be done if you're still having concussion lawsuits at the NCA level. So you're never going to hear the end of this because, again, with CTE, and as you guys both former athletes, you well know, sometimes it takes decades, you know, and you don't really know if you have CTE until after you pass away. So I'm not going to see the end of it, but um, yeah, it's, it sucks. It sucks that this whole thing had to happen on Hashed again with Tua, but hopefully people learn from it. Let's switch gears entirely. So we talked about really uh, three cases involving physical assault on the field in different ways, shapes, or form. And I'm going to let you do the heavy lift here. Again, you're closer to the soccer space than, than we are. Uh, and as a female on this podcast, as a female voice that I, I know you follow all these stories very closely. I know the story is close to you. This is a story that has picked up a lot of steam. You know, ESPN just had a documentary that came out and I watched. It was fantastic. I was texting you, you know, last weekend about it. And a lot of stuff I didn't really know about. I've never heard of allegations like this happening at the professional level. Certainly you hear it, you know, in gymnastics and maybe in high school at the collegiate level, you know, coaches doing things improperly with, with players. I, I haven't really heard it to this extent at the professional level. And it wasn't just once, it wasn't just twice. It was a lot between some high level coaches and high level players. So, and the floor is yours. Um, I, don't, I don't think most of our audience will have known about what's going on. So, Feel free to, to talk in broad brushstrokes and then, you know, we can try to unpack it. Absolutely. So I think first I want to start with it's the the word that keeps coming up is that it's systemic abuse and there are allegations of of widespread systemic abuse. And it's not it's coming out more and more and more every day. There's a new story. It's not really just some coaches. It's a majority of coaches. Um, we are seeing a lot of high ranking um you know, uh, uh, team organization officials are stepping down, are resigning, et cetera, et cetera. But just to, uh, I guess we'll start, makes sense to start with a background. So about a year ago, a little over a year ago, what really, in my opinion, um, started this was North Carolina coach Paul Riley. There were, you know, there are allegations that he, there were kind of, kind of private allegations, not really sure what's going on, sexual misconduct, not really sure, not really sure. What ends up coming out is that he had been accused of sexual misconduct for years and games were canceled that weekend. And basically players just had had enough and they are um, going on social media platforms, explaining that there is a culture of abuse in the NWSL and we're tired of being silent and kind of putting it in the forefront. In response to what happened with Paul Riley at North Carolina, the NWSL brought in an outside law firm to do a deep dive into these allegations and they hired them in October of 21. Now in a few, um, in October of 22, fast forward obviously to now, that report is being released. And that report, um, for those of you who don't feel like reading it, it is a 300 page report. It was done in my opinion, incredibly well. It's very thorough. And it basically highlights the system of sexual misconduct abuse throughout the NWSL since its inception in 2012. Um, the thing that I think that is, is, is disappointing is that we're coming to find out that people, this isn't new. These are allegations aren't new and people knew about these for years and it was reported for years and players came forward for years and high, like I said, these high ranking officials were kind of just saying, like, just sweeping them under the rug saying, okay, yep, 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 we hear this, we hear this, whatever. 
um, and not doing anything. And now all of that is coming to light. And that's why you are seeing all of these firings and people stepping down. Merritt Paulson from Thorns, I think he was the, what was he, the CEO, just um, voluntarily stepped down and issued the statement about how, you know, he's he was hoping that this league, this league could be the shining example for women's sports, blah, 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 blah. I think it's sort of bullshit. He knew about this for years. He had allegations of probably the worst of the worst, which is Paul Riley, for years and did nothing. So for him to come out now with all of this flowery language about his hope for women's soccer and women's sport in general, I think it's crap. A little bit of background, you know, and, and I think to, to, to set the stage, right, there's been a number of, you know, you have to talk about the women's national team, obviously, Tremendous successes. And, you know, it's been, you know, an up and down history with women's pro soccer leagues in the United States, despite the successes of the women's national team. So you've had startup leagues, VC money pour in, the, v, the league exists for a little bit, fails, exists for a little bit, fails. The NWSL is a different model and they've been very successful. Most successful women's pro league maybe ever. I don't really think that's that controversial. Emily, can we, can we say ever? Is it controversial? Uh, most successful in the United States. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, we have a successful league and everyone's kind of, you know, all, all pumped up about it. And then you have these kind of skeletons that pop out. And so I don't know, without people should read, there's a ESPN did a long form story. And if you're if you're a podcast fan, which I imagine if you're listening to this, you are ESPN Daily. If you go back um, about a week or so ago, they did a, a tremendous long form breakdown. But just to, to paint the scene, you have these coaches in these high levels of power, right? These women's pro soccer players, you know, similar to how we talk about, you know, the WNBA players or Brittany Griner they're they're not getting paid nearly as much as they should for you know the, the skills that they have and these players feel so indebted to these coaches at least the stories that i was reading that like the, there's certain instances that came up that like they just felt that they couldn't say no in certain situations to coaches in in, in really kind of like sexually explicit and sexually suggestive situations players that were you know like uh, riding the bench thought they could do something to maybe get ahead and get on the field and it's like you know, if that's the culture that we're in, that there are, you know, acts like that occurring between coaches and players and it's coerced, it's very uncomfortable. And, and, and I see raising your hand. Go ahead. I have, I have some more thoughts on it. So the NWSL is the third attempt at a professional league in the in the U.S. And like you said, Dan, you're right. It is the most successful runaround. But these women, the, you know, these allegations are saying that these, they were typically men in power, in power positions, that these women had no reporting capabilities to come forward because they came forward and either a was swept under the run or rug or b like you said there's allegations where players were coerced into sleeping with their coaches and when they said no or when they got a boyfriend or when they got a girlfriend got traded got traded got traded or were benched and were explicitly told you don't want to sleep with me you're not playing and so i think that it's also really really important in my opinion to recognize that that there, I think there are very few things, especially in the legal world, that are black and white. That what I think needs to be said is that these women did nothing wrong, and these women are the victims here. And these coaches and the the high ranking officials were all utilizing their their positions of power. They knew that the women didn't have any other option to play. They knew that this was their only option to play professionally within the United States, and they took advantage of that. And they took advantage of them. Okay, so this is where we need to just uh, dig into this a little bit because I'm, I'm going to let you give your opinion. I'm going to I'm going to give mine. You can tell me if you think I'm wrong, if I'm right. That's my um, favorite thing to do, Dan. Yeah, but this this part, you know, jokes aside, like I, I think this is the part of the story that's I don't know if people are just scared to say it, but I think we can say it on our on our show. Like this is a, a I mean, what is it? It's it's a it's male coaches in a in a female sport. Right. And that's what seems troublesome. Right. That not that then there's no issue with that, but that the allegations are that these male coaches are coercing these these female you know, players are doing certain things. So, right. The story that that got the biggest, I guess, the most traction within this world. Right. Was, OK, these were being reported. And I think there was a change in commissioners at some point in time. I'm not exactly sure of the years, but at a certain point in time, the NWSL appointed a female commissioner named Lisa Baird. And she was sent an email by two of the players that, you know, had these alleged incidents and with some level of detail was sent a, an email that was, you know, uh, Alex Morgan was involved in the reporting of one of these events. But the commissioner of the league, a female commissioner, was sent the entirety of the incident that talked about a coach having 
inappropriate sexual contact with a player. And the player who reported it was the one that sent the email. So there's no question about veracity, right? The person reporting it is the one that was involved in it. This uh, commissioner, Lisa Baird, again, female commissioner, is accused here, and this was the, really the heart of the CSPN story, of sweeping this under the rug. A female commissioner being told by the female players, female executives, that something needs to be done. And she goes, you know what? This is investigated. Moving on. I'd love to get a cup of coffee with you in person. And the real heart of this ESPN documentary is her being called out and getting really, um, I don't know, uh, uncomfortable in the chair, scratching her neck a little bit. Um, well, I, I, would, I didn't really know. I wasn't sure. Like, uh, I'm just going to say this, I mean, this is the part maybe is controversial. If this was a male commissioner that swept this under the rug, I think the story would be a hundred times worse. The fact that it's a female commissioner sweeping under the rug, maybe you could tell me it's worse. Maybe you can make the argument. I find the whole thing just disgusting, like just really gross. I guess I'll start with, I agree with you on your last point that this is disgusting. But what I do think, I think it's easy and I think it's lazy to look at um, Lisa Baird. And I think the ESPN documentary is great. However, they put a, I, I thought, and Dan, you just uh, confirmed that, they put a real spotlight on Lisa Baird and what she did wrong. And she swept it under the rug. And she's a female commissioner who is um, of a female sport league and blah, 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 blah. I don't understand how there are so many people who did things wrong in this, in this situation. And we're still focusing on the female commissioner. And that's a problem. And the problem, because the thing is, the majority of quote unquote bad players in this were men. But still, we find a way to point to the one female commissioner and say, Lisa, I, what, are you, what are you doing? Here's what you did wrong. And this is what you, blah, 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 blah. How about every single male that was involved and that was doing these things? And then that, and then you look at all the men who the players came to and looked to for help. Lisa Baird is one among many. The thing that differentiates her is that she's one of the the few women who had real power in the league. And again, like it's it's easy and it's lazy to look at her because there's so many other people to look at. So so Dan, what you said about you know, I I think we, what you were getting at is it you know different because it was a female, like I said, a female commissioner of female league. It is as bad as you just said it is because there's so many male men involved. Just so you don't think I'm a crazy person, I've watched Alex Morgan, who's you know huge name in the sport. That was, you know, it was almost, and again, you, you, you played at a very high level. It was almost like a, a kind of like, you know, how could this happen with the female commissioner? That's why we wanted to put a female commissioner in charge of this league. So at least my, my observations was from the players themselves saying, how could this happen? How is it possible? But, you know, obviously it goes without saying the coaches, right? There's been a, you know, for lack of a better term, like a bloodbath of coaches being fired across the sport, left and right, people being exposed, hiring their daughters, high school soccer coaches that have no uh, background in the league. And, uh, you know, hopefully this work gets cleaned up, you know, male, female, whoever is the root of the problem uh, by all means. And the new commissioner of the NWSL is fairly new at this point is a Fordham law alum, Jessica Berman, who is a member of the Fordham sports law society. Once upon a time, uh, she was a former AGC with the NHL met with Jessica, you know, once upon a time member of the S sports lawyers association. So yeah, I'm wishing all the best to Jessica and hopefully, you know, the NWSL can continue to thrive and continue to grow from this. But I thought the documentary was wonderfully done. And yeah, I, I mean, like people should be paying attention to it. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll just add this. And again, if there's more, that if it's not, not my place to say this, but I think it's great that when one person speaks out, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. Uh, and that's what happened. I think in the aftermath of that ESPN Dockery, even, even more people spoke out. And even more allegations came to fruition. So I don't think we're done seeing this. I think Jessica Berman over at the NWSL has got a lot of heavy lift. And what we say, at least what I tell my clients, I speak to industry clients, I speak to agents all the time. I just tell people to get ahead of it. Once you sweep one thing under the rug, right, then it's your head, right? Then then your head's on the on the pike at the end of the day. So, you know, just the sport's got to be cleaned up and it's not just women's soccer. There's issues that occurred and you know, the NBA, the NHL, you know, the NFL, we just talked about a bunch of them. So I think it's always better to be preemptive on this. And if you find a bad player, don't try to find excuses for them. Try to get to the bottom of it, a transparent report. And it's good. I'm happy it came out 300 pages. Right. Like, why did it take a year to come out? Right. Maybe, maybe this should have been done four or five years ago. And that's again, to the male executives as well within the Portland, uh, you know, Thorns organization seem to try to sweep some of these things under the rug. So Lisa Baird certainly not going to get all the blame, but why she has to get some of the blame is because even today she got caught in that crazy lie. She's like, I never got that email. And 
she did get the email. So I think everyone gets the blame, but ESPN chose to focus on her. And I think Alex Morgan and the, you know, the EPs behind the scenes probably said like, this is the, uh, the oddest part of the story, which, you know, I, I, I certainly get it. And I'll let you have the final word on this. What else do people should be following, should be paying attention to? Uh, well, so the last thing I just wanted to say was that one, people should follow this because I think we we have to go back and and, and this is this, women coming forward and being able to speak it it's it's the chain reaction what you said is one person come forward comes forward then two then three this all started really when the women female gymnasts came forward however many years ago on the larry nasser incident and so now they have more and more um support and power and attention to do these things but the last thing that i will say is and really kind of like you were just saying connects um the idea of just cleaning up sport in general we have to remember at the end of the day that although we all were a nation that loves sport and we love it and it's our entertainment and all the rest of it at the end of the day all of these these athletes are people and they're people first and these allegations are incredibly serious and they Im- implicate the lives of so many people just put aside the athletic part people and just the same way that the nfl not tua is responsible for implementing structure that supports these players the nwsl is responsible for implementing structure that supports these women so i think i think this is going to i do not think this is close to the end of this and i really do encourage people to to continue to follow it and also not to to continue to support women's sport and continue to support positive change in women's sports listen we people all the show long enough know that we are a fan of sports docs Athlete A is the uh, great uh, in Netflix. Well, it's on Netflix now about, um, you know, USA Gymnastics and people coming forward. So, uh, again, uh, I could say it until it blew in the face. Sports law comes in all shapes and sizes. If you are a fan of sports, you're a fan of the law. I can find you any, any particular story. But that said, let us close the book on the NWSL. We have one piece of business before we put this in the books. Podcast sponsored by Better Edge. If you don't want to do your betting against the house on a DraftKings, on a uh, FanDuel, any of the, the houses, the sites where you compete against the house, right? Where the, the site is just gobbling up the money. You want to compete against people where you have a good chance of winning, competing head to head against social peer betting. That's going to be Better Edge. Our sponsor there, head to Better Edge. Use our promo code CONDUCT for $20 for free. Conlon, we alluded to this at the beginning. Okay. We're not going to talk about how Emily beat you in fantasy football. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. That is objective. Uh, if you got Conlon's pick, on the Friday, you downloaded our episode, you subscribe, just like we tell everybody to do, and you listen Friday morning. Maybe you pushed, but if you were the other eh, many people that listened on Saturday and maybe Sunday morning, we, we get the numbers. Uh, you might have got the line at eight or eight and a half, in which Conlon, which case Conlon, that would be big fat L. So I see Conlon on the Zoom. Your name is Conlon. Yo, yo, just three. Hold on, hold on. Three dash zero dash one. I'm going to give it to you. By the time you recorded it, it was a push. So we could still call you Mr. Undefeated. You are still allowed to be on this podcast. Conlon, give us a winner this week. No ties. A winner. So, Dan, uh, listen, I apologize for the money that I lined your pockets with for the first three weeks. But here's the deal. Vikings pushed on Sunday. They were seven-point favorites. That's why I came out of it. They are up 21-3. Kirk Cousins uh, flops in the second half like a dead fish. And it is what it is. I don't lose. I push. You know, I, we want to win tickets. But pushing is not the worst thing in the world. This week, we go back to cashing. Cashing tickets with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this week who go to Pittsburgh, an awful Pittsburgh Steelers team. Tampa Bay normally hitting their stride this time of year. They're getting healthier. Tom Brady is now lifeless, and he is on the track to basically – he's going to win another Super Bowl this year because he's cut the dead weight at this point. He's literally, Tom, fully focused on football. Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now on better edge or at plus 101, minus eight and a half. Take them there, telling you the Steelers are bad. They're a bad football team. Tom Brady and the Bucs, vintage performance out of Brady. That's where you hit this week. Colin, I, I'm sensing a lack of enthusiasm. You're all like mighty riding high. I missed a three and oh. Listen, if you really think you're undefeated, I need I need some of that bravado. But listen, we'll, we'll take it to the booth. If you can win this week, maybe we'll talk uh, on a future podcast about Changing uh, the quarterback rules about roughing the passer and, uh, you know, some of these weird rules. But Brady was certainly the beneficiary of that against the Falcons last week. Conlon, uh, as always, we appreciate your your betting insights. So we'll give it to you. We'll say you're still undefeated. But that tie, you look like the Indianapolis Colts right now, which is not by no means a compliment in this day and age. But we're going to put this episode in the books for Dan Wallach, myself, Emily, Conlon. 
Appreciate everybody joining us each and every week for Sports Law. For all of us here at Conduct Detrimental, we will see you next time on another episode of Conduct Detrimental.